But Mark chapter 6. And I'll give you a little background of what's going on in this chapter. When you get in the book of Mark, you've got a lot of action. It's really to the point, and this is all about the life of Jesus Christ. But then you get some details about some other people. We're going to talk about a man tonight that, that is a very interesting study. So in this chapter, verse 1, you've got the disciples following Jesus Christ. In fact, it says in the last few verses, Mark 6, 1, his disciples follow him. And then um, verse 3, you've got some controversy. Look at the last few words of verse 3, and they were offended at him. There's some confusion about who the Lord Jesus Christ is. Verse 6, he marveled because of their unbelief. And then beginning in verse 7, he sends out the twelve. And uh, look at what the 12 are doing now in verse, in verse 12, 6, 12. And they went out and preached that men should do what? Repent. It's a good message, isn't it? It's a good message for today, back then as well. And then you get down there to verse 14. He sends them out there and, and, uh, with the ability to cast out devils and heal there in verse 13. And I want to start in verse 14. And you got a little, little side story here. you got the ministry of Jesus Christ, but then you got a little side note of some, something else that happened. Look at verse 14. And King Herod heard of him, and that's Jesus, for his name was spread abroad, and he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. Others said that it is Elias, and others said that it is a prophet or as one of the prophets. And I, Stop right there. You notice the division about the identity of Jesus Christ in those verses? Has anything changed in a couple thousand years? People still have controversy over who the Lord Jesus Christ is. You know, your eternal, your eternal destination, your salvation depends on who you believe the Lord Jesus Christ is. You better get that right. Do you believe he's the way, the truth, and the life? Man, that was kind of weak. If he's the way, the truth, and the life, and you believe that he's the way, the truth, and the life, you've got it down as to who he is. If you trusted him as the one, the only one that can save you and make you right with God, you've got his identity down. But there's a lot of controversy, uh, particularly outside, uh, outside a place where you're getting the truth preached as to who he is. Okay, look at verse 16. But when Herod heard thereof, he said, well, let's, see, well, let's see what Herod gets it right. He said, it is John whom I beheaded. He is risen from the dead. Now, who's he referring to? He's talking about Jesus. At this point, John the Baptist has already put to death. But now you're going to get something that's not chronological. It goes and tells you what happened to John the Baptist. But you're noticing that Herod is not right about Jesus Christ. He thinks it's this man that he had put to death, and he's back from the dead. Here's a man who believes in a death, burial, resurrection. Just not of Jesus Christ. It's of John the Baptist. Isn't that wild? And I'll talk about why that's the case here as we get to the message. Look at verse 17. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John, and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Therefore Herodias had a quarrel against him, and would have killed him, but she could not. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and holy, and observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Now let me stop there. If you stop right there, it sounds like Herod had the right attitude toward John the Baptist, didn't he? But did you notice there's somebody mentioned in this passage here that is out to get John the Baptist? And that would be Herodias, this wicked woman. We'll talk a little bit about her tonight. Look at 21. And when a, notice the wording, when a convenient day was come, the Herod on his birthday made a supper to his lords, high captains, and chief estates of Galilee. And when the daughter of the said Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod and them that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, Ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it thee. And he sware unto her, Whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee unto the half of my kingdom. And she went forth and said unto her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. Are you seeing extreme wickedness right here in this passage? And we'll dive into that here in a moment. Look at 25. And she came in straightway with haste unto the king and asked, saying, I will that thou give me by and by in a charger the head of John the Baptist. Do you have this in your mind how this is going? A girl, I don't know how old she is, says she's a damsel. My guess she's probably a teenager, maybe anywhere from 12, 13 to 15, maybe even a little older than that. She goes to, to King Herod and asks 
for, of all things, the head of John the Baptist. Isn't that something? Is that disgusting? That's disgusting. That's wicked. Talk about why that is here in a moment. Look at 26. And the king was exceeding sorry, yet for his oath's sake and for their sakes which sat with him, he would not reject her. And immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head in a charger and gave it to the damsel. And the damsel gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard of it, they came and took up his corpse and laid it in a tomb. And we'll go through this account tonight. We're looking at uh, the message is called the prophet and the politician. But this is really a journey into the heart of a wicked politician. We'll spend uh, most of our time on that. And why this man stoops to this level here. You think studying King Herod might give us some insight into why politicians in the year 2020 do the things that they do? Anybody out there? I guarantee it will. You look at Herod, and he's a classic politician, much, oh, very much like the politicians you see today. You find out from Herod, this account, why politicians do some of the things they do. So let's pray together, and we'll get into this. Lord, we want to ask for your discernment and direction as we go through this tonight. I pray all of us would glean something. We would be able to see this world the way you see it. Lord, help us to examine our own hearts tonight so that we are not like this man, as we all could certainly turn out and do some things and act the way this man did. Uh, we don't want to do that. Uh, if there's anybody here among us who just doesn't have any understanding of what's going on here tonight with uh, preaching from your word, I pray that they would be convicted of their need to be saved and uh, they would make things right with you and understand in, uh, the matter of the heart is most important. And we just ask again for you to be glorified and you to have uh, your way in this message here tonight. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Why would a man to do such a wicked thing? Why would he do that? Go over to Mark chapter 7. And let's look at the reason why anybody commits a wicked act. If you're here last Sunday, Sunday morning, this goes hand in hand with that message. Why do men do the wicked things they do? And when I say men, I, I use that in the collective. That's men, women, that's children. Why are people wicked? Look at Mark 7. Look at verse 21. This is the identity of the, the, the reason why people do wicked things. For from within, out of the, what's it say, folks? Out of the heart of men proceed, and you're going to get 13 things here, evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. Now, folks, the only way that you can have a heart that those things don't come out of is for you to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. And did you know that even a person who is saved has to yield to the Holy Spirit on a regular basis so these things don't proceed out of the heart? As I was reading there, I hadn't even thought about this, but I was reading, I, I was, you can match up several, I don't know about all 13, but a number of these things here in those verses with what happened there in Mark chapter 6 with Herod. There are several, th I mean, right off the bat, adulteries. What did the, the guy do? He took his brother's wife, didn't he? Um, evil thoughts, well, you make a case for that. Uh, covetousness and pride are all in there. Anyway, uh, that's all the things that come out of the heart of man. And, and I say that because, again, if you're, not, if you're saved and you're not yielded to the Holy Spirit, folks, I believe the same person could be in danger of having these things come out of their heart. What do you think? Oh, if you're saved, yield to the Holy Spirit in the morning, and then again in the morning, and then again in the morning, and then again at noon, and then in the afternoon, and then again in the afternoon, and at night. I mean, sometimes, you know, you really have a, if you're like me, you can't wait to go to sleep because it's like, okay, I'll get a break from the flesh. And then you got to fight that flesh when that alarm goes off, don't you? That flesh wants to stay asleep, stay in bed. So we'll take a look at this man here. here. And uh, this is the mind of a man, and we all should be able to relate. This is the mind of a politician, and we should all have a better understanding of how most of them operate as we go through this. This is the mind of a man's dealings with a true prophet of God, John the Baptist, speaking forth the word of God. And we all need to consider how we deal with the word of God when it's presented to us, when it's delivered to us. So you remember that the word of God, Hebrews 4, is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of. So I hope that we'll all take this and look at our own hearts. 
because it's easy to read this and say, man, I'm glad I could, I'm not going to be like Herod. That's a wicked man. He did some wicked things. You better watch it. You can have some of the same motives and some of the same attitudes that Herod had. So let's take a look at this man here, back there in Mark chapter 6. And let's look at the first thing here. Uh, I'll read again, uh, verse uh, 14 down to 16. And it says, King Herod heard of him. And that's, he heard of Jesus. For his name was spread abroad, and he said that John the Baptist was risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in them. Others said it is Elias. Others said that it is a prophet or is one of the prophets. Now watch Herod's attitude towards John here. But when Herod heard there heard thereof, he said, it is John whom I beheaded. He's risen from the dead. Now, why would he say that, folks? What do you think? Why would Herod be concerned about a man that he put to death rising from the dead? Well, the only way that could happen for a man to rise from the dead, he'd have to have a lot of power. He'd have to have the power of God to rise from the dead. You think that Herod's conscience might be wearing on him a little bit? What do you think? Herod knows he did wrong when he had John the Baptist put to death. And folks, just because he got rid of the man... He didn't get rid of the event that took place when he got rid of the man in his own heart. And because of that attitude, or that, because of that act that he committed in killing this man, it is still haunting him. Are you seeing that? This is an unsaved man, and he is haunted by what he did because he knows in his heart he was wrong. Folks, you can do wrong, and you can think that nobody knows about it, and it's 20 years past. Here it comes. Still haunts you. Kind of quiet in here. Look at verse 17. For Herod himself had sent forth and laid hold upon John and bound him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife, for he had married her. For John had said unto Herod, It is not lawful for thee to have thy brother's wife. Now, Herod heard that. He heard John preach about his sin. And folks, that's what a, a man of God ought to do. He ought to, call out, he ought to call out sin. And it shouldn't matter how high the guy position has, how high of a position the guy has as far as authority goes. He ought to call him out for his sin. And he's called out there, and then look at 19. This is where it gets interesting, 19 and 20. Therefore, Herodias had a quarrel against him and would have killed him, but she could not. Okay, so there's Herodias' attitude towards John the Baptist. She said, I want to get that guy. Look at 20. Look at, look at uh, Herod's attitude. For Herod, what's it say about Herod, folks? He feared John. That's the first thing I'm going to talk about here tonight is the attitude of fear. For Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just man and unholy, and observed him, and when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Now, let's talk about just the, the nature of politics and politicians here. Do you see, just reading about this man here, he is pulled in different directions by his wife. This man fears John the Baptist, his wife wants him dead. So he's pulled in two different directions there. Now, go back to Matthew chapter 14. You've got to get a little insight in, into this whole situation from uh, the other gospel accounts. So look at Matthew 14, and let's get a little more insight. Talk about fear here. Uh, should you have fear? Let me just ask you that before we get into this. Should you have fear? You ought to have the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So we ought to have a fear of God. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. But let's cover the wrong kind of fears. So look at Matthew 14 here. So this guy already is being pulled in a couple different directions. Let's see what else is happening. Matthew 14, uh, go to verse 3 so you get the idea of what's going on here. It says, uh, for Herod had laid hold on John. Uh, let me back up here because you get the same thing over there in uh, Mark. Go to verse 1. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus and said unto his servants, this is John the Baptist, he's risen from the dead, and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him. For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother Philip's wife. For John said unto him, it is not lawful for thee to have her. Now, that's pretty much the same as Mark, isn't it? This is why you need to read all the gospel accounts. Verse 5 is going to tell you something you didn't find in Mark. You've got to put this together with it. Look at verse 5. And when he would have put him to death, he feared who? The multitude, because they counted him as a prophet. It sounds to me, if you put Matthew's account and Mark's account together, it sounds to me like John was ready, or Herod was ready to put John to death, very likely because of the influence of who, folks? Herodias. But then John is torn. So he's torn in one direction. Herodias wants him dead. He himself does not like that John preached against him, but deep in his heart he knows John is right. Herodias says, kill him. So he said, okay, I'm going to kill him. But then he realizes, verse 5, the multitude, actually a lot of people consider John to be a prophet. They would have maybe had a mutiny if he had killed this man. They'd have gone against him. 
Do you see how a politician is torn in several different directions right here? One way by his wife, one way by the people, and then in his own heart, he, he's, he's torn about what to do. And, and I say this for, look, we could sit here and criticize politicians. And we, I'm not going to do that. Instead, here's what I'd like to say. Because of this, do you think that since Herod was torn in a couple different ways as to what to do, you think any of our politicians today might be in the same boat? You think they might be torn as to, do I do this? Do I do that? Do I want to please the people? Do I want to please my wife? Do I want to do what I know is right in my heart? Because the heart is not always right. Or do I want to follow the truth and do what God said? And I say this, I, we all ought to pray for our politicians. I mean, uh, talking to Don about this for church, more and more. Now, and then, now more than ever because of them being torn in so many different directions. And we haven't even included, uh, you could probably find this in the scripture somewhere, but you got the lobbyists today, don't you? And they'll pay money to get their way. So you got politicians got a tough job, folks. I could sit here and criticize Herod, but you got to understand he's being torn in different ways. Are you and I being torn in different directions today and just decisions we got to make in our lives? You got, do you have the world influencing you, trying to influence you? Do you have the devil trying to influence you? Do you have the flesh, your own flesh trying to influence you? Do you have the Lord trying to influence you? How much are you letting the Lord influence you? It's a good thing to ask yourself. How much? How much you spend in time so the Lord, in the Word of God so the Lord can influence you. If, I'll tell you this. This is uh, something that you all know. If you're, more, if you're listening more to the Word of God than you are all the other voices, you're more inclined to obey the Word of God. If you're listening to voices besides the Word of God, you're more inclined to obey their voices. Isn't that true? You know what the world does? They tell you the same message over and over and over, louder and louder and louder, because they're trying to convince you of something. How about you get the same message from the Word of God over and over and over, louder and louder and louder? Now, you've got to decide you want to allow that, but that'll have an influence on your decision-making if you do that. So there's something to think about there. Now, let's talk about this thing about fear here. Uh, fear, you go back to Mark chapter 6 there. Fear is all over this world. It is everywhere. So some of the things I, I wrote down here, that uh, you got to fear today. Well, you don't have to fear these today, but you're told to fear these today. Uh, this is one reason why I watch and, and view, uh, read, whatever, as little news as I possibly can. I think I, I, I want to know what's going on in the world, but not that much. I don't want to know everything that's going on in the world. So I'll give you a few fears that are pushed on the, by the media today, and I just kind of took a glimpse today just to kind of see what's, what's the most recent. Number one, Probably number one on the list, all the news channels today, coronavirus. You should be scared. Fear the coronavirus. Everybody is really up in arms about, oh, we should be so scared. Now listen, what can you do? What, really, right now, what can you do? I'll tell you what I'm doing. Two things. Number one, I'm going to trust the Lord. Number two, I'm going to take some vitamin C. So I'm going to do, I mean, really. And any time there's any kind of sickness at my school, that's what I do anyway. Take a little extra vitamin C. So I think that's wise to, to be on the lookout. But at the same time, folks, if you know the Lord, you shouldn't have a fear of anybody else or anything else. And I think when our fears escalate about all these different things, it's proof that we don't fear God. Anybody out there? When we have all these fears of other things, I think it's proof that we don't fear God like we should. You fear God. I'll show you a couple verses in a minute you can hang your hat on. If you fear God above anything else, your other fears will subside. So let's take a look at this. Um, coronavirus, number one. Number two, this has been the last few years in our country. You should fear gun violence. Right? That's what they want you to do. Oh, be, be in fear. Stay in your house so you don't have to be exposed. You could just stay in your house and be a recluse the rest of your life, and you don't have to fear any of this stuff, right? But what, what, what kind of existence is that? Number three, fear the Republicans. Number four, fear the Democrats. Okay, I'll throw it in there. Fear the independents. Fear all the rest of the parties. You, you see, you get all this from the news media. How about this one? Fear the Russians. Isn't that something? This has come full circle from when I was a kid in the 80s. Fear the Soviet Union. And now we're still supposed to fear the Russians, right? That's what you get pushed on you all the time. Of all the countries in the world, fear the Russians. How about this one? Fear the effects of climate change. You should be in fear of that. That's what the, mood, uh, the news tells you. Um, and how about this one? You don't hear a lot about this one in this, this particular time, but you'll hear about it sooner or later. Fear the economy because it's going to crash. Fear the economy crashing, and then, oh, it's, everything will go to pieces, right? If you, I'm looking at a crowd here that's been around for a while. 
You've seen all this stuff come and go in the past, haven't you? Did the Lord take care of you? You think the Lord might take care of you again and again and again? All right, so some verses to hang your hat on concerning fear. Go to Psalms. Go to Psalm 25. Psalm 25. Now, if you fear the wrong things, you will become paranoid. Did you notice that with Herod? He's paranoid. He feared the multitude. He feared, what do I do here with John the Baptist? And then finally he gets put to death. We'll look at the account of how that happened. But then he's feared that he's back from the dead. He's paranoid. Was John the Baptist back from the dead? No, but you see the paranoia of this man? Fear of the wrong things breeds paranoia. Now watch out for that. Look at Psalm 25. Psalm 25, verse 14. A couple of verses to hang your hat on concerning the right kind of fear. Look at verse 14. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. Folks, you know what you get that the world doesn't get by fearing the Lord? You get understanding of his word, the secret things of his word whenever you fear God. And isn't it interesting that all these things that I mentioned here, they become very conspiratorial and secretive? And I'll tell you, you want to get into the world of fear, I, I warn you about this, I warn you, because I, I, unfortunately from experience, you want to get into the world of fear, start studying conspiracy theories, it'll scare you to death. All this secretive stuff going on behind the scenes. And you'll, you'll think, oh man, I've got to watch out for this, and I've got to watch out for this, and I've got to watch out for this. And there's a couple of popular uh, guys on the news, that, uh, a couple of news channels that were really, are really big on this. They fear monger, don't they? And they're tr I, want, I wonder sometimes, well, why do they want you to fear so much? They're trying to get you to put your trust somewhere besides in God. And ultimately, they want to be the ones to tell you what to do when catastrophe strikes. Hello, you've been here for hurricanes, haven't you? What do they tell you to do? Head for the hills, get out of town, board up your houses and you still might die. When the hurricanes are coming, in this fear mongering, this is what the media is all about. All, I mean, all about that. And I, I warn you about the conspiracy stuff. You get too much into that. Some of it's kind of fun to study, but you get deep into that. And all that happens is you get this fear of the unknown because you're always wondering what's behind that door. Who's down that street? Who's watching me? Oh, that's the wrong kind of fear. That's paranoia. Fear God, folks. You got nothing else to fear. Psalm 27. This is a really good one. Psalm 27, verses 1 through 3. Good verses on the fear of the Lord and uh, how it will actually affect your behavior and attitude. Psalm 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Look at this. Whom shall I fear? There's a question asked there. If the Lord is your light and your salvation, who do you have to fear? Is the Lord going to take care of you or not? If he is your light and he's your salvation, he's going to take care of you. You say, but you don't know what could happen to me. I could die. If the Lord is your light and your salvation, you're okay if you die. Only if he's your light and your salvation. You're okay. Look at verse, uh, the rest of that verse. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? The wrong kind of fears reveal that the Lord is not the strength of your life. You can be saved, not have the right kind of the fear of the Lord, and you can be afraid of all this nonsense. Just like old Herod. You know, think about Herod. He's in a high position. Those guys in those high positions shouldn't be fearful of anything, should they? I mean, they're pretty well taken care of. But what do we find out about the guy? He's scared to death. Lives his life in fear. Look at verse 2. When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat, my flesh, eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Hallelujah. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. Why is the writer here, uh, this is Psalm of David, why is David so confident here? You know anything about David? David knew the Lord. And he knew the Lord, and he knew the Lord would take care of him. Remember when Saul was chasing him all the time? Did David have good reason to be afraid? And what did he keep saying? Lord, I, I want to be afraid right now, but I'm going to trust you, so I'm not afraid. And the Lord took good care of him. Amen? Watch out for the wrong kind of fears. Don't let fears rule your life. Allow the fear of God to rule your life. you got nothing else to fear, folks. Nothing else to fear. Go back there to Mark. Let's get this second point here. So fear. Fear God. You don't have to fear anything or anybody else. All right, look at uh, Mark chapter 6 there. And let's go down there, verse 21. Let's see what's next here. 
I'm giving you three things here. The first one is fear, and the second one's there in verse 21 that you want to be, be watch, on the lookout for, watch out for in your own life because these things actually uh, had a great influence on Herod. So look at verse 21. And when a, what's that word say after the word a? Convenient day was come. Convenience. Watch out for fears, the wrong kind. Watch out for conveniences. I'll give you, I'll give you a silly illustration, but hopefully it'll hit home with the point. So when I was a kid, and I still do this today, uh, I refer to the stores associated with gas stations as convenience stores. Does anybody else do that? Some of you folks my age and older probably do that. Or, oh, Brandon, you do too. You're younger than me. All right. Some people still use that. All right. Uh, now, I could go to the convenience store to buy a loaf of bread. I want you to keep that in mind. I could. Or I could go to Publix to buy a loaf of bread. Convenience store, Publix. Or I could go to Walmart and buy a loaf of bread. All right, now, let's, let's, let's go in order of least convenience. Order of least convenience in my world is Walmart. I hate going, I got an amen there, yes. I hate going there because it's so big and I gotta walk so far and park so far and it takes my time. But the bread is cheaper there than it is at Publix, which is smaller and easier to access. But the bread is cheaper there than it is at the, con you pay a great price for the littlest things at the convenience store. You go to the convenience store, you wanna buy a candy bar, they want like a $2.29 for a candy bar. You go to Walmart for the same candy bar, you might be paying on a good day 99 cents. So you see that? I, I, now that's a silly illustration. But I'll tell you this, conven that, that's a silly illustration, but it illustrates what I want to say here. Convenience is often costly. You pay more at the convenience store because it's convenient. And they know that, don't they? They market themselves in a way that they got to come here. They want it fast. So we'll charge them as much as we possibly can. <laughs> way more than Walmart, way more than Publix. So let's look at this thing about convenience. Go to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. Convenience, two verses on convenience. When I think of convenience, I think of what's easy, right? What's the easiest thing to do? And uh, easiness oftentimes goes along with what is comfortable. Watch out for being too comfortable. So look at Mark chapter 14, a little, little light on this word, uh, convenience. Verse 10, 14, 10, and Judas Iscariot, one of the 12, went into the chief priest to betray him, that'd be Jesus, unto them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought how he might what? Conveniently betray him. An underhanded task done in convenience. Are you seeing this? When can I do it where nobody else will be around, only him and his disciples, and I'll bring these other guys in and we'll take them. You see the underhanded sneakiness with convenience in that verse right there? Look at another one. Go to Acts 24. Really got to watch out for this one. Acts 24. Watch out for convenience. What is convenient oftentimes is what is most dangerous. And again, convenience is often costly. So look at Acts 24. Go down there to verse 24. And this is where Paul, Paul gets an opportunity, just like John the Baptist, to preach to a bunch of political big shots. Guys, way up there. And Paul does not back down from preaching the truth. He's not like these preachers today. They get a chance to preach to the, the politicians and they water down the message. He gives it to them right down the plate, waist high. So look at 24, 24. Acts 24, 24. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Here's a politician and his wife hearing about the saving power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen to that. Look at 25. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Now, I don't know for sure. None of us really do. But you wonder if that convenient season ever came. Because when somebody postpones a decision for Jesus Christ in, in, in the, for, for the sake of convenience, they oftentimes never get around to doing it. Isn't that true? Beware of convenience. Convenience is costly. Let's see why. Go back there to Mark. Mark chapter 6, where we were there. And let's see what happens here. So this convenient day arrives. And let's see what happens on this convenient day. 
By the way, I'll just, before we get into this, I'll tell you, sin is much more convenient than living for the Lord. It is much more convenient to just live for the world, live for yourself, than live for God. But you know this, you should know this, sin is costly because convenience is costly. All right, look at 22, back there in Mark chapter 6, look at 22. On this convenient day, let's see what happens. And by the way, back there in verse 21, interesting little tidbit, and I, I, I apologize if your birthday just occurred or it's coming up. But I got to make a statement here. This is really interesting. In verse 21, it's Herod's birthday. Did you know there's one, only one other time in the Bible where somebody's birthday is mentioned? It's in Genesis 40, and it's Pharaoh's birthday. You know what happens on Herod's birthday and on Pharaoh's birthday? Somebody ends up dying. Somebody's put to death by the guy in charge. Now, I say that for this reason. I want you to have a happy birthday if you've got one coming up. Sherry just had one. However, you know there's something a lot more important than your physical birthday. If you're born again, the day you were born again is way more important. And yeah, I think the Lord might have done that on purpose. A physical birthday is celebrated because that's our physical life coming into existence on this earth. And how were you born into this world? You're born a sinner. Isn't that something? So I think that the Lord might have done that on purpose. There's a little message on birthdays. Birthdays celebrate your first birth, and your first birth, if you're not born a second time, that first birth takes you to hell. I don't say that to be mean. I say that to be biblical. So don't take offense. You want to really have a good time? You can celebrate your birthday, but more importantly, celebrate your second birthday if you know the date. I don't know the exact date of mine. I know, I know generally, but I don't know the exact date. Some of you know the date, so, don't you? Celebrate that day, amen? And you can tell people, today's my second birthday. And they'll say, what are you talking about? People only have one birthday. Not me. Not me. What are you talking about? I was born again. Then you got a chance to witness to them, right? All right, so uh, let's look at this convenient day. Verse 22, look what happens here at this supper. Now, notice in verse 21, there's a big supper. It's Herod's birthday, and he's got all the big shots around, the, the lords, the high captains, and chief estates. So these are all these guys he's trying to impress. Look at 22. And when the daughter of the said Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod, and then that sat with him, the king said unto the damsel, Ask of me whatsoever thou wilt, and I will give it thee. All right, now there's his first problem right there. First off, look at what pleased Herod. Do you see that in verse 22? On this convenient day, what is it that pleased Herod? It's the dancing around of a little girl. Now, you start to really take a look at this. This little girl becomes a pawn in the grand scheme of things by her mother. And I, I, I won't say a whole lot about this, but I'll tell you what. With political, politicians and celebrities and so forth in our world today, some of this has come out in the news. There's a lot of this nonsense going on where little children become pawns. And I'll, that's all I'll say because we've got some kids here tonight. We've got a wicked, wicked situation right here that has not changed in 2,000 years. So don't be surprised by what you see. I mean, I ought to appall you, obviously, but this has not changed in a couple thousand years. So he's pleased by the dancing around of this little girl. And then look at his promise that he makes there in verse 23. So he's pleased by the wrong things. You ought to be pleased with what pleases God. And then he makes a stupid promise, just a foolish promise. Look at 23. And he's swearing to her, whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it thee under the half of my kingdom. Folks, if you're going to make a promise, you better be willing to pay up. And you better be willing to understand if you make a promise like that, how much it could actually cost you. Because the guy just said, up to the half of my kingdom. He's about, he give it away to this little girl. So that's a foolish promise. So look at what pleased Herod. Look at what Herod promised. And uh, last thing here, look at the predicament he ends up in. Look at 24. She goes to her mother. She went forth and said unto her mother, what shall I ask? And she said, the head of John the Baptist. Now you understand now why I say that little girl was a pawn? She's used wickedly by her own mother to get what she wants, and it involves the death of an innocent man. You see all this come to fruition here? And again, I, I could name some names here. Some of the stuff's been on the news here in the last, oh, probably six months or so, and it lines up perfectly what's going on here, right here. Just wicked stuff. Look at 25. And she came in straightway with haste to the king and asked, saying, I will that thou give me by and by in a charge of the head of John the Baptist. So now he's got himself in a predicament. So Herod made himself vulnerable. It would have been better for him not to say anything 
than to say something that he would end up regretting. And I think that's something we can all learn from. It is better to say nothing than to say something that you might end up regretting that you said. Just keep your mouth closed oftentimes. When in doubt, just zip it up, right? It's good advice for all of us. So then um, let's see what happens here. Notice how the, the person behind the scenes here, and, th and this is how the devil operates behind the scenes. The person behind the scenes that actually gets this task accomplished is this woman, Herodias. So do you see how a wicked woman is the driving force behind the evil that is about to happen? I'll say that again. Can you think of any, any people in our government here in the last, oh, maybe 10 or 12 years? A wicked woman is the driving force behind the evil that is about to happen. I won't name any names. I'll let you just let your imagination go. Well, I'll give you one from the Bible. 1 Kings 21. Ahab and Jezebel. There's a cowardly king ruled by his wife. Do you remember? We actually hit this last Sunday morning. Naboth, he wants Naboth's vineyard. Naboth says, I'm not giving you my vineyard, man. The king goes home sad. He's moping around. The queen says, what's wrong with you? I want that guy's vineyard. He won't give it to me. He's crying, moping around. And she says, I'll take care of that. And I'll tell you what, you know, just for all you men here, a woman gets things done oftentimes. And that's why the men got to step up to do what's right so the wrong kind of women don't step in and do the wrong thing. I, I, I say, here's, what, here's the thing, I, I got an amen from a woman, hallelujah, thank you Lord. I say this because I have worked for some women in my past that have been really good leaders. And I will tell you what marks a good woman leader, they get stuff done. But you got to make sure, if you're going to work for a woman leader, and I was fortunate to work, work for one for a few years, she really wanted to do, I really believe she wanted to do what pleased God. And what was really neat is she would ask me, she used to come to me and say, Micah, I'm not really sure what to do in this situation because I don't really know the Bible as well as you do. Can you tell me what to do? That was a real blessing. So I, I say that because women get things done, and if a woman's, not, a woman's not walking with the Lord and she's got a position of leadership, she will get things done. And she will be literally, in this case right here, cutthroat when she gets it done. Watch out for that. Now, I'll give you one more. Go to Revelation 17. We'll have a little fun here just for a minute. Revelation 17, there's a wicked woman you want to watch out for, and she is, she is a religious organization. And she will be in alignment with a wicked man in the tribulation. Uh, the, the beast is coming, folks. Beauty and the Beast. Oh, what a great movie. What a great picture of what's to come in the tribulation. See, a lot of you watch that, maybe you saw that when you were a kid, or you watched it here, I don't know, recent years, and you missed that. Beauty and the Beast, look at this woman here, right out of your Bible. See, Hollywood has no original plots. They have to go to the Bible to get their plots, but then they take them and they twist them around. They want you to think it's okay, Beauty and the Beast. You get the real story in Revelation 17 here. Let's look at this woman. We don't have time to look at the man here, but let's look at this woman. Uh, look at this woman, uh, verse uh, 1. There came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show, thee, show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored what? There's Beauty and the Beast right there in your King James Bible. Full of names and blasphemies, having seven heads and ten horns. Look at the woman here, verse 4. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abomination of filthiness uh, of her fornication and upon her head, forehead was a name written 13 words in all caps by the way no coincidence 13 words mystery babylon the great the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth and uh, you can read the rest of that you find out that woman is connected with i tell you real quick go to the end of the chapter here i'll show you this real quick verse um uh verse uh 18 last verse in the chapter and the woman, who's that woman? The Bible tells you. The woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Can you think of a, a city that has power over the kings of the earth? That's a part of the United Nations. It's a city that's a country that has a ruler, that's a religious leader and a political leader at the same time. He wears a, couple, he wears a hat sometimes, he's got a couple of horns. You ever notice that? Kind of interesting. 
Do I need to t- tell you who I'm talking about there? Folks, I tell you that because that's a woman, an organization depicted as a woman that's in alignment with a wicked man in the tribulation so that the world does exactly what they tell them to do. Worship the beast is what, what they want. So isn't that interesting? It all goes together there. We'll get a little off on that, but interesting stuff how that lines up here with Herodias and Herod. A strange woman, a wicked woman, and a wicked ruler. Very interesting how that all goes together. Now, um, you go down there to verse, uh, oh, by the way, I'll I tell you something that's interesting. I just kind of thought of this. Real quick on that whole thing about uh, the beast and um, that woman. What happens to the two prophets of God in the tribulation? What happens? The beast prevails over them. And again, his alignment with the woman, you wonder how that's going to work out exactly, because we're not given a lot of details on that, just that they're killed. And then notice back there in Mark chapter 6, verse 15, who was uh, one of the people that they mistook Jesus Christ for? Uh, Elias, which is Elijah, which I believe he very well is one of the men coming back to preach in the tribulation. And if you haven't studied this out, here's a fun study. This will take you the rest of the week if you want to really dig into this. Study in the Bible the relationship between John the Baptist and Elijah. It'll knock your socks off. It's really, really interesting study. Those guys are very, very, very similar. So uh, it's interesting how he happens to be the guy that ends up dying here, John the Baptist, and he's got a lot in common with Elijah. Okay, look at verse 26. Let's get this last point. We got fear. Watch out for having the wrong kind of fears. Watch out for convenience, because all this happened on a convenient day. It was the right time for Herodias to take advantage of the situation. And then look what happens here. The last thing is sorrow, and this is the wrong kind of sorrow. There's good sorrow, and there's uh, the wrong kind of sorrow. Look at verse 26. And the king was exceeding sorry, yet for his own sake and for their sakes which sat with him, he would not reject her. You noticing something there? The king is regretting his decision to make the promise, the little girl. Yet at this point, he's looking around at who's at the table with him. Notice it says there, notice the details in verse 26. Yet for his oath's sake, and for their sakes which sat with him, he would not reject her. Do you realize these big shots are sitting around looking at him thinking, I wonder how he's going to handle this one. If he's going to be a man of his word, he's not going to care if somebody dies because that's just how we do this. I'm talking about in the world of politics. So they're all watching him, and he doesn't want to lose face with his buddies. They might think he's a coward. But the real coward is the man who doesn't do what's right. Amen? That's a real coward. Do what's right in God's sight. And he should have done that, but obviously he didn't do that. So look at 27. Sad verse right here. And immediately the king sent an executioner and commanded his head to be brought, and he went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head in a charger and gave it to the damsel, and the damsel gave it to her mother. Just a disgusting scene there. But I back up there to verse 26. He's sorry. But the sorry ended there. He had a feeling of being sorry. You understand, folks? You can't just go on feelings. He, he felt sorry for what he was about to do. He felt sorry he made the promise. He felt sorry for John the Baptist. You could probably make a case for that because he realized who he was. He was a good man. But let's end up here. Go over to 2 Corinthians. Let's talk about this thing about sorrow. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Sorrow can be a good thing if it's the right kind of sorrow. So I think you can match up old Herod with the wrong kind of sorrow here. Look at 2 Corinthians 7. Why are you going over there? Even though Herod knew it was wrong, his foolish vow got him into trouble. Even though he knew it was wrong, he wanted to impress people around him. Even though he knew it was wrong, he would not say no to a wicked woman. And I say that for all the men here, myself at the top of the list here, uh, I just read Ezekiel here, I think it was last week, I was in Ezekiel, got through there, and uh, the Lord says, I sought for a man among them to make up the hedge. Couldn't find one. Looking for a man to stand in the gap, and we need some men to do that today. And it doesn't matter what kind of position you got, it doesn't matter what kind of job you got, uh, if we got just the men in this church to take a stand and do right and be bold, we get something done, folks. If you're a man here, uh, and again, I'm, this is for me at the top of the list here, Let's do right regardless of what it may cost us because ultimately it's worth it. It was a lot more costly for Herod in the long run than it would have been for him if he'd have done right. It might have cost him his political position if he'd have done right, but it had been worth it in the long run, amen? 
2 Corinthians 7, look at verse 9. Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to what? Okay, when sorrow leads to repentance, turning to God, getting right with God, that's good. That is good. But look at what else it's contrasted with. For you were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us and nothing. So watch verse 10, you get the contrast. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to what? Amen. Amen. Not to be repented of. That's the good kind. But look at this kind. Here's the wrong kind of sorrow. But the sorrow of the world worketh what? Isn't that something? Herod was sorry. But he did not have godly sorrow that led to repentance. Had he had godly sorrow, he said, deals off. I said something that was foolish. I never should have said that. If I end up keeping my word on this, an innocent man is going to die. And I know I said it, but I shouldn't have said it. I'm going back on my word. Little girl, you got to pick something else. I'll give you something else. That's what he should have done. That would have been the right thing to do. But he had this worldly sorrow. And what's that lead to? In this case, it says, the sorrow of the world worketh death. In that very case right there, it led to the death of a, of a man that didn't do anything wrong, John the Baptist. Ultimately, it led to Herod's death, which is really sad here. Go back. I, I know I said we're going to miss but I want, or end here, but I want to go one more place. Go to Mark 14. Uh, rather... Luke 23, my, my mistake, Luke 23. You don't get this account in Mark. Let's see what happens later on in Herod's life. Now remember, he has had the wrong kind of fear. He has been a man of convenience. And on that convenient day, a, a, man, that, a man died that should not have died. And he's been a man that's sorry, but he's not got the right kind of sorrow. So, uh, by the way, it's real easy to look at Herod and say, well, that's just him. But anytime we open the Bible, it ought to be a self-examination, right? I'm telling you, I've had the wrong kind of fears. Allow the Lord to drive those things out. Have the fear of God instead. I'm telling you, I've, I've done things out of convenience that I should not have done. Allow the, Lord to do Allow the Lord to control you so you do things sometimes that are difficult but worthwhile in, in the Lord's sight. And then the last thing here, um, I've been sorry not to repentance, and I've been sorry to repentance. The Lord would have you be sorry to get things right with him. That's the purpose of having sorrow. That's a feeling God gives you that should lead you to make things right with God. So let's end up here, Luke 23. And uh, notice who shows up here. Face to face with old Herod, 23.4. Then said Pilate to the chief priests and to the people, I find no fault in, them, in this man. And they, this, speaking of Jesus Christ. And they were the more fierce, saying, He stirreth up the people, teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. When Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man were a Galilean. Now, you understand the, the dispute here is what to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. So look at 7, verse 7. As soon as, he, that, as soon as he knew that he belonged into Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. Are you noticing something about these politicians? Man, this is really interesting. Pilate is higher up in the political hierarchy than Herod. Folks, what did Pilate already declare in verse 4? I find no fault in this man. If he's higher up than Herod, it should have ended there. But what does he say? He says, send him to Herod. You think that Pilate might have been influenced by maybe um, the people? So he says, oh, oh, he lives in Herod's jurisdiction? I'll send him down there. Maybe Herod will take care of him. So look at what happens here. Verse uh, 7, as soon as he knew that he belonged in Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. Verse 8. And when Herod saw Jesus, and by the way, folks, uh, my understanding of this is this is the same Herod that put John the Baptist to death. Same one. He saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season because he had heard many things of him and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. Here's a man who already has rejected truth with John the Baptist, right? Here he is face to face with the man who is the truth. And what does he want? He doesn't want to go before him and say, Lord, I need you. Lord, I'm a sinner. I need you. He says, maybe this guy will perform some miracle for me. Are you seeing anything in the world that's similar to the way that Herod approaches Jesus Christ? Why do a lot of people want to, want to uh, know something about Jesus Christ? Maybe he'll do something for me that nobody else could do. And he can save you. But it's always something besides that that people want. You ever notice that? All right, so let's see what happens here. Verse 9, then he, and that would be Herod, questioned him, 
question with him in many words. Sad few words here at the end of verse 9. But he answered him nothing. Folks, if you're not, if you don't have the right approach to the Lord, he will not give you any truth at all. He'll give you no light. He'll hide it from you. And that's exactly what happens here. So Herod wants something, the wrong thing. He wants a miracle. And then the Lord ignores him, doesn't answer him. Look what happens as a result. You get, you get a glimpse into Herod's heart here. Look at verse 10. And the chief priests and scribes stood and vehemently accused him. And Herod, with his men of war, set him at naught and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. How glad was Herod to see him? He really just wanted him to do what he wanted him to do. You ever notice people approach God like that? I want God to do what I want. And when Herod didn't get what he wanted, what does he resort to? Mocking. Puts him in a robe, making fun of him. You see this man, how he is. He got face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you see how he responds. It's, it's sad. It's the saddest thing. Here's a man who has pre previously rejected the truth. He stares the truth, the Lord Jesus Christ, in the face. And now he gets nothing in return because of his attitude. Folks, your heart attitude will determine what God gives you as far as truth. You've got to have the right heart attitude when you come to his word. So um, notice how, look at the next verse, verse 12. And the same day Pilate and Herod were made friends together, for before they were at enmity between themselves. Isn't that interesting? Political unity against a common enemy. Who's the enemy? The Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that something? Political unity against a common enemy. Uh, we're seeing the same thing in the world today, aren't we? Now, we could stop here and reflect on how bad our world is and how they're just like Herod and Pilate, but how about we uh, take a look inwardly, all of us, before we end here? And i got a couple things to ask you. I've asked myself as well. Going back to our points, who do you fear more? God or men? Or the things that men tell you to fear? Your answer to that question will determine your heart attitude towards God. Really will. Who you fear determines really how you view the Lord. Second thing, are you more interested in that which is convenient or that which is right? There's something to chew on. Convenience, folks, is costly. And last thing here, are you sorrowful over your own sin and you want to make things right with God because you know you sinned against him? Or are you sorrowful because you didn't get your way or you look bad in front of everybody else? We oftentimes have the wrong motive for sorrow, don't we? So we took a journey into the heart of a corrupt politician tonight. And again, it's easy to say, well, I'm not him. I'm not like that. But folks, um, it could be. Any of us could be like that man. You say, oh, I never do that. You better check your fears. You better check out what you're doing with convenience. You better check out what you're doing with sorrow. All those things can be in the right fashion or in the wrong fashion. So I, I just challenge you. Uh, let's, all challenge, let's all just take a look at our hearts tonight here. We'll have a word of prayer and have a time of invitation. And um, let's all just examine our own hearts in light of this. Not in light of what I said, but what of the word of God. So let's bow together. Sure want to thank you, Lord, for uh, giving us your word. I would love to say that I have nothing in common with hair, but I certainly do, and uh, certainly can relate. And your word is a mirror, and it just reveals to us what we really are. Uh, help us all to respond to you, to your word, in a manner that would uh, be the right kind of fear towards you, uh, the right kind of sorrow, the godly sorrow that you mentioned. And uh, Lord, help us to do something with this message here, not just go away and forget about it, but really do something with the word and the Holy Spirit working on us. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.